All right, hello everyone. This is Shane Fisher again. I'm your host, and this is Brother David Key. Say hello, David. Well, hello everybody. And we're now on. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> uh, just glad to be back. <laughs> we're here with the Looney Tunes behind me because you know Christians are known for being crazy, right? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> we're known. We're Looney. Yeah, that's what they. That's what they think. <laughs> Uh, but anyways, uh, we're back with part four of our series in which we're going to talk about the book of Daniel, specifically the prophecies. We've looked at part one, the early date, and I believe that's the, of course, the evidence for that. There are a lot of evidence for that. But now we're looking at specifically the prophecies and just want to remind everybody, this is Brother David's book here, which is Daniel the Apologetic Prophet. You can order it from Yeoman Press. And you can actually get it directly from David, David Key 312 at gmail.com, as you can see on the screen there. And so we're going to be in Daniel chapter 8 today. All right, so Daniel 8. So when we think about Daniel 8, uh, we think about uh, basically two main points that Daniel, he's going to, there's expressing the vision, and then there's, uh, the interpretation, the explaining the vision, and that's what we've, you know, seen in chapter two. Uh, we've seen the, uh, you know, it gives the dream, but the interpretation, and then we also even saw in chapter seven as well. We saw the the uh, vision and interpretation. So in Daniel eight one and two, we find what this is what it says: In the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, the king. A vision appeared to me, Daniel, subsequent to the one which appeared to me previously. I looked in the vision. While I was looking, I was in the citadel of Susa, which is in the province of Elam. And I looked in the vision, and I myself was beside the Ulai Canal. Uh, so what you can see here is that this is this is the third year of uh, Belshazzar that would make it since Belshazzar started in 553. Then that would make it 550. And remember, we're we're in a topical format. Um, we're we're now have entered the Hebrew section, right, David? Yes. The, yeah, that we're uh, transitioning out of the Aramaic into the Hebrew. Um, chapter one was Hebrew, and chapters eight through twelve are Hebrew. Mm -hmm. And the, and the reason why, as we've said before, is the prophecies of eight, nine, uh, eleven, and twelve deal mainly with israel um and well and its relationship to the to the nation the gentile nations around it um, right so, right and uh you're going to see that after the, even the vision ends just look at chapter 8 verse 27 and it actually takes a terrible toll on david i mean D D david on daniel so <laughs> Well, I'll it does take a, it does take a terrible too. toll on us when we actually, you know, study the history of this and uh, all, all of the stuff that you know the details. It kind of it kind of bogs you down a little bit, you know, in a sense. Yes. Yes, there's a yeah, there is a lot of there is a lot of historical background information that um, it's almost impossible to really include in a, in a talk like this. That mm -hmm. could be helpful to know, but. Uh, so we're going to hit the highlights, I think, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> right. <Yeah>. So, <laughs> like otherwise said, we'll, be, we'll be here for three days. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he said he was in Susa, which is actually becomes the capital of the next world empire, uh, in, you know, Medo-Persian empire. Very interesting enough. And he says also, uh, he says, I saw in the vision I was I was by the river Ulai. Um, so he's by the Ulai Canal, which was an ancient canal located between two rivers where ships could pass through on either side. So I find that very interesting. Yeah, I do too. Kind of gives you a hint about maybe what, you know, what he's about to talk about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. So why don't you read verses three through five? Then I lifted my eyes and looked and behold a ram which had two horns was standing in front of the canal. Now the two horns were long, but was, but one was longer than the other, with the longer one coming up last. I saw the ram budding westward, northward, and southward, and no other beast could 
stand before him, nor was there anyone to rescue from his power, but he did as he pleased and magnified himself. And as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Okay. So here we have two animals, right, David? We got a ram, and we also got the he-goat. Um, yes. Um, where is it? Well, I thought I saw it here. Oh, it's male, so, a male goat, yeah. A male goat. Um, so tell us, uh, of course, I know we're going to look at the interpretation, but we'll just quickly give people an idea here. So who is the ram? Yeah, the ram is the is the joint empire of the Medes and Persians. Um, and as we'll see here with the two horns, that seems to be the... Uh, be what's going on here and of course daniel later on in the prophecy he's, he's basically going to tell you what what these images are referring to anyway but yeah, yeah. we got the per, the uh, medo persian empire and then the male goat is uh, the greek the greek empire and um although the name alexander the great is not identified uh, i don't think anyone disagrees that that's who that's referring to <laughs> mm -hmm. And just, uh, you know, another thing, this actually corroborates what we were saying about Daniel 2. Um, you know, a lot of the liberal scholars like to say that the four kingdoms represent Media, then Persia, the, I mean, sorry, Babylon, Media, Persia, then Greece. Um, but here we see that, okay, this ram has two horns, one's longer than the other, and it makes sense because we're going to see later on uh, Media and Persia are actually together. And that's the way we all yes. see it as well. So, yeah, and the, and the imagery, you know, like in chapter seven, the, what we talked about last time, the, that imagery of the third of the third empire fits also very well with Alexander the Great and what Daniel's talking about here with the male goat. And so, the liberal critics really have no leg, no no pun intended there. I guess no leg to stand on. So. Mm -hmm. Um, so in regards to uh, Dan, uh, just giving you a little bit of history of the Medo-Persians and why we call it the ram with two horns is because horns refer to power. And so we, we kind of ask ourselves, well, how did Persia rise to such a world power and join with the Medes? And um, it seems to be the case that you can go to Genesis 10 verse 2, uh, talking about the table of nations, the Medes came from Madai. Uh, is what okay. is what is said. Uh, so basically, they were a bunch of independent groups, actually tribal. They were a bunch of independent tribes, and they were up there in the Zagros mountain range. And um, we actually have our first historical reference uh, is the Assyrians who make reference to the Medes in about 850 BC. And the Medes were actually a vassal state to the Assyrians. Uh, and, they, and they became that in 676 BC. Um, and here's the Zagros Mountains here. So this is what we're talking about, this area here. And uh, basically, they're like we said, the, the Medes actually were several different tribes, but the, and the Assyrians were oppressing them. So they united together with the Babylonians to fight against Assyria, in which uh, both uh, Babylon and uh, the Medes actually conquered Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, in 612. And uh, we find this was actually prophesied in Nahum, right? So Nahum chapter 3. Um, it's very interesting. Okay, enough. yeah, yeah, yep. Um, because, you know, we remember that Assyria was a very cruel nation. Um, even uh, there was a time when they did repent, when Jonah came. They did repent, but it had been about a you know, they went back to their old ways after about a hundred years, and sadly, they um, turned they turned away from God, and so God judged them for that. Yeah. Um, so here we have, you know, several different gr uh, rulers like Deokes. It's also spelled a little bit differently, but just to let y'all know, that was one uh, one of the rulers of the Medes who ruled at Ecbatana, and then we got Feortes. And he fights against one of the Assyrian kings named Ashurbanipal. He died in battle, and so Sarxes comes to rule next. So he's the third ruler. 
of the means. So there's Soxeries. He's very young. He, he has to go against the Scythians. Um, and for the next 10 years, he rebuilds the Median Empire. Uh, then he launches an attack against uh, an Assyrian city called Arapaka. Um, and so on and so forth. So, you know, it's all about fighting against Assyria. And we know that finally Assyria is defeated uh, when Nineveh was destroyed in 612. So just to let everybody know about that. But you're all welcome to read this for yourselves if you like to stop the video. Uh, then, of course, uh, Soxes, he campaigned uh, in other, what we would call uh, modern-day Turkey. Um, there was what's called the famous Battle of the Eclipse, took place in 585, and, and uh, Soxes, he died in that same year, is what we find out. And then we got Ostiagus. Ostiagus can't comes, and he's actually defeated by his grandson, Cyrus II. Um, very interesting uh, history here for you to read about. Uh, we're not going to go into too much of this, but I'd love for you to you know take a take a look at this yourself. I think it's very interesting stuff. Uh, so we know that Cyrus he actually became ruler of Anshan in 559. And it's was under it was actually under median control. Uh, and then we also know that um, basically uh, Cyrus was able to capture his grandfather, Ostagus, and that's where actually we come uh, the Medo Persian Empire. Uh, that's why the Medes and the and the Persians would join together. So that's why it was born and their laws and customs and culture were all conglomerated, conglomerated together. And we see over the next couple of years that Cyrus, he, he, con he goes against Lydia. He defeats Caressus. Um, and then, of course, Cyrus keeps on. And we know that one of the main things is that Cyrus actually conquered Babylon. He captured it in 539 B.C. So, And then we got, um, I'm just going to go a little bit forward here. We know that Cyrus was very humane, you know. Remember, we already talked about how he allowed the uh, Jews to go back to their homeland to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. But I want to go a yes. little bit further because we're going to talk more about this when we actually get to chapter 11. So we're going to skip some of this, but there's all the Persian rulers that come up um, that are very important. But we're just going to we're going to get the highlights here. Uh, so let's get to um, next. Well, let's see, we got Xerxes, of course he's a Persian ruler. Uh, as you can see, we got a lot of history here. That's why we were saying <laughs> we, we got uh, you know so much we could talk about, but we're going to just keep going. Okay, so like we are saying, Daniel sees a male goat, which comes from the West, which is exactly right. Macedonia is what it's called. And he comes across the face of the whole whole earth without touching the ground. What, what does that mean about touching the ground without touching the ground? What does that, what does that signify to you, David? Um, it just shows you how swift and how quickly he comes to power. Um, mm -hmm. If you remember in the prophecy last time, the, the uh, third empire, it had four wings um, indicating, it's, you know, the, the quickness, the, the rapidity how fast Alexander came to power and conquered the, you know, uh, the world empire basically. So yeah. that's, I think that's what it's talking about. Of course, you know, Alexander the great, you're, I'm sure you have some more information about him, but you know, he died, he also died young. So he quickly came to power, but then he also died young. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It says when he was strong, the great horn was broken and four conspicuous horns came up toward the four winds of heaven. So we, we kind of already referred to this uh, last time, but who are the four four horns? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, they're the four divisions of uh, the four generals um, mm -hmm. of of the Greek Empire. Uh, if I remember correctly, let's see, you got the Seleucids and the Ptolemies, mm -hmm. and then uh, the other ones. Uh, I always forget those. Let me think. <laughs> Is it Lysimachus and Sander? Yeah. I think. I can't yeah, remember. Cassander, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Listen I guess Kais. I don't remember those other two. Yeah, I don't remember those other two as much, obviously, because Daniel doesn't address those. <laughs> but uh, he does. 
he does mention the four divisions of the empire and later on in chapter 11 especially you're going to see that those two divisions of the, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies are going to be fighting each other and of course Jerusalem's in between like you said is a like a football being kicked around but um, in this prophecy um, there's you know one of the four notable ones um, we're going to soon see that Daniel is going to zero in on one of those four mm-hmm. talk about a specific ruler uh, among one of those four so with regards to the history of Alexander the Great, and he came from Macedon or Macedonia, and uh, it was actually viewed as you know small and backwards. That's how the Greeks viewed it. Um, the, his father, Philip II, was born in 383 and became a king in 359 BC. And uh, Philip was actually able to you know unite the Greek city states um, is what went on. So. Basically, you can learn more about that if you like. It's very interesting. We're going to keep on going a little bit forward here. So, uh, like I said, I'm just going to keep on going here. So, Philip, we know he was assassinated in 336 B.C. So this, like we were saying, Alexander, his son, comes to power. He's able to put down these minor revolts in Greece. And then in 334 Alexander crosses the, the Hellespont, uh, which is, you know, between Greece and Turkey. And he defeated the Persians at the Granicus River. And, he, and, and there's other um, great battles that are famous uh, that he faces, like Isis and stuff of that nature. Um, so I'm going to go a little bit further here. Um, like we said, I showed a map already of the what where he had conquered at. Um, but let's go a little bit further. So, yeah, so we'll, we'll start here. So, we know that he conquered all of this land. I mean, it says that um, the little horn, uh, the Me- so we know the male goat was Alexander the Great, and he, his empire spread all the way from Macedonia to India. And, like we yeah, said, that's when- pretty impressive. <laughs> And when he was at the zenith of his power, he died at 33 years old. And, and I found this very interesting. Uh, this is a poem. Uh, I don't know. Some say it's unknown. Some say it was written by Charles Weed. And I think it's very interesting just to read it. And, uh, you know, there's a good application for us. So you, would you like to read some and I'll read some? So. Sure. All right. Jesus and Alexander died at 33. One lived and died for self, one died for you and me. The Greek died on the throne, the Jew died on the cross. One's life triumphed seemed, the other a loss. One led armies forth, the other walked alone. One shed a whole world's blood, the other gave his own. Jesus, and now, uh, one won the world in life and lost it all in death the other lost his life to win the whole world's faith jesus and alexander died at 33 i guess i accidentally put that in twice uh one died in babylon one on calvary one gained all for self one himself he gave one conquered every throne the other every grave the one made himself god our god made himself less the one lived but to blast, the other but to bless. When died the Greek, forever fell his throne of swords, but Jesus died to live forever, Lord of Lords. I'll let you read. Jesus and Alexander died at 33. The Greek made all men slaves, the Jew made all men free. One built a throne on blood, the other built on love. The one was born of earth, the other from above. One won all this earth to lose all earth and heaven. The other gave up all that all to him be given. The Greek forever died, the Jew forever lives. He loses all who gets and wins all things who gives. <laughs> I think that's there's a, a lot cool of poem. yeah. I mean, that's uh, there's a lot of a lot of good uh, lessons to learn from that poem. I think. Oh, definitely. I mean, a man gains the whole world. What if a man gained the whole world and loses his own soul? Um, and that's what we see with Alexander. That you know, it, it said that he conquered the whole world and he 
cried because there was no no other thing to conquer. So, yeah, very sad. Yet at the same time, pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. So, like we said, um, the it, it divided up into eventually. Uh, I mean, it started out with a bunch of generals fighting one another, but finally it came down to four generals. And uh, we know that Ptolemy received Egypt, Seleucus received Babylon, Persia, and Syria. And once again, let's just remind the audience, why why are we focused on the Ptolemies and Seleucids? <laughs> yeah, so the Ptolemies are in, are in Egypt, and the Seleucids are up north in, like, Syria. So Jerusalem is right in between those. Right. Look at the map. And in so, chapter 11, we're going to see that Jerusalem is caught kind of in between the wars between these two uh, parts of the empire. And it's almost like a soap opera when you read it. <laughs> mm-hmm. So um, so look, verse 9, um, maybe I didn't actually put these on here. So verse uh, 9, I should have added these to the text. I guess I did, forgot to accidentally do that. I could do that real quick, actually. Not that hard. Um, let me go ahead. Well, I don't know if I have it later on here or not. Oh, there we go. Well, I, I didn't get verse 9, so let me, let me go ahead and read verse 9. Out of one of them came a little horn which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. So this little horn, we, we're going to come to be known as the Antiochus Epiphanes, the fourth. And uh, so it says here, uh, David, grow exceedingly great toward the south. Um, so what would that would be referring to? And then toward the east. What would what would that mean there? Um, I guess Antiochus, he's going to... Uh... He's going to conquer Egypt. He's going to the south. Um, that means he's going to have to go through Jerusalem mm-hmm. um, along his way. Um, mm-hmm. I forgot all the details about Antiochus, what exactly he did. It was pretty impressive, if I remember correctly, how he came to power. It's so, there's so much involved with how Antiochus kind of came to power. And you, you kind of learn more about that in chapter 11. But uh, mm-hmm. the details are so intricate that it's kind of hard to memorize. <laughs> yeah, and the glorious land, of course, is Palestine, the, the Holy Land, as we would call yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And you'll okay. see that again in chapter eleven. That that reference Palestine, Jerusalem. And, uh, we could say the east to Asia, see, Asia Minor. Yeah, um, yeah. So. yeah. Okay, so verse 10, you want to read that for us? Sure, and it grew up to uh, to the host of heaven, and it, ca- and it cast down some of the hosts and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. So basically so what's this here, about? yeah, the, um, the host of heaven and, and the stars there is talking about the, uh, the Jews, um, God's chosen people, and then the, the stars probably reference to the authorities you know, he, uh, if I remember correctly, um, he replaced the, uh, the high priest with someone who is, who is not from, from Aaron's lineage. And of course he brought in all kinds of Greek customs. And of course, this is why the Jews obviously did not like Antiochus Epiphanes. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, could the stars be linked to the promise to Abraham that Abraham yeah, yeah, that's, that's, also, that's, that's also a possibility. You're going to see that star imagery is used uh, later on in Daniel in chapter 12. Um, Verse 3. Yeah, yeah, talking about God's... So, you know, and like you said, Abraham, the promise to Abraham, and how, you know, the whole world would be blessed and that he would, you know, have descendants, um, you know, uncountable like the stars in heaven, whatever. Mm-hmm. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that could very well be a reference to that as well. Yeah. Um, you know, we know the Jews were to be a light to the nations, uh, to the Gentiles, but they unfortunately did not do that. 
Um, right. And this is, you know, I think it's really interesting. I think it's found in Philippians chapter two. Mm-hmm. Um, let me let me go there real quick, and because it has something okay. very very interesting for us. So it's uh since we're the new is since Christians are the new Israel today, um, it says. Uh, that okay, so it says that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. So, holding yeah, fast to the word of life, yeah, that I agree with you there. That's an interesting parallel. I never thought about it in light of Daniel, but that could very, very well be kind of a hint or a, an allusion back to that. Well, and another thing here um, that we might talk about is, um, you know, Deuteronomy 32. Uh, well, uh, maybe I shouldn't bring this up, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> the Tower of Babel. Um, yeah. It talks about how, you know, God divided the nations among the sons of God. And, um, you know, in Daniel 10, we, we actually learn about there is, there are angels over certain territories. Um, yes. And uh, there's Michael, he's over Israel, as we learn. Um, but uh, there are others of the, over the other territories. Um, and, right. there, and so there is this heavenly um, battle going on behind the scenes. We don't know much about it. Um, but... Uh, this may have something to do with this is that what happens on earth some some so to speak is you know somehow linked to what happens in heaven so the you know the I, I don't know it's just one of those things uh, yeah any, any um, thoughts about that well we know that God is in control and the Bible says that God raises up kingdoms and brings them down and the question is well how does God do that of course I mean we Obviously, God can directly control things, but perhaps, and it seems this way, God uses angels to, uh, as a medium for him to, to influence this world. Mm-hmm. And we don't, know all, we don't know all the details or the mechanics of that, but just reading chapter 10 of Daniel and the references there with to angels and how they seem to play a role behind the scenes with, with how God operates— Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, I, I don't think we can deny that angels somehow or another play a role in things. I don't know. Obviously, they don't override man's free will, mm-hmm. just like God does not override man's free will. But they do play some influence and some role in things. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I mean, the fact that he, that Antiochus is conquering the the land, uh, the Holy Land, uh, yeah. you know, so. So we know he's a he's a major enemy, and I would urge everyone to read First and Second Maccabees Josephus to learn more about this guy. Yeah, you know, just as a you know, Antiochus Epiphanes, the Jews know full well who Antiochus Epiphanes is in, as far as their history, because basically the celebration of Hanukkah kind of arose because of what Antiochus Epiphanes did. So, um, mm-hmm. it, you know, not that I'm saying we should celebrate Hanukkah or anything, but I'm just saying that there is a rich history here that, that even Jews recognize. And so we would do well to kind of learn some about it, especially since Daniel predicts it. Mm-hmm. All right. So um, going a little bit further. Uh, so in Daniel 8, it says, I, I just want to read it one more time. Verse 11 mm-hmm. it says, He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. So let's talk about he exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. What is that yeah, it's, referring that to? Could, um, either that's referring to God himself or that's referring to the high priest. Um, we know mm-hmm. that I, if I remember correctly, he had Onias the third killed. He did. Basically. And uh, that was the last lawful high priest uh, before Antiochus did all this crazy stuff. Yeah, so there, that could be a reference to that. We do have coins that show Antiochus on there, and he actually called himself God Manifest. Yeah. So shows you yeah. uh, how humble he was. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. I um, think, 
they had a they called him, didn't they call him Antiochus Epimenes? Yeah, the like, madman. The madman. <laughs> so, yeah, there's it, basically I, there's an interesting history about about him and what he used to do. Like, uh, just in a lot of ways, you know, very similar to some of the Roman Caesars that we talked about last time. You know, just a really bad guy. Mm-hmm. So, um, and, uh, before we get into it, you know, I don't want to to jump ahead too much, but, you know, in, in the last prophecy, um, chapter seven, you know, my view is the little horn was Titus, who in Titus, of course, destroyed Jerusalem. We could say he desecrated Jerusalem. Uh, interestingly enough, this little horn here, as we shall soon see, uh, is going to desecrate Jerusalem as well, which to me kind of gives some coherence to the, to both or to all the prophecies in Daniel and kind of in a very subtle way, strengthens my interpretation of chapter seven. But anyway, <laughs> I thought I'd throw that in there. Um, so it says about him that the daily sacri- by him the daily sacrifices were taken away and the place of the sanctuary was cast down. So what is that referring to? Well, like I said, uh, the, the, the sacrifices were taken away. We know that... Um, well, we know, of course, he he brought in a pig into the into the temple. Mm-hmm. Obviously, he desecrated Jerusalem in that way. But if, you know, he killed Onias and appointed. He had some guy appointed that wasn't even part of Aaron's. Yeah. You know, and so the whole Levitical system was kind of screwed up, pretty much after Antiochus. Yeah, I mean, sell, selling it to the highest bidder, basically. I mean, that's yeah. What he... There's that's an interesting. I think there was a guy named Menelaus, and then there was a guy named Jason. And there's, mm-hmm. That's an interesting history as to how all that developed. But um, um, yeah, starting with with all that, that whole the whole system, the whole Levitical system started to get screwed up mm-hmm. because of Antiochus. So I mean, these morning sacrifices they actually ceased for a while. That's what happened, and um, you know these were actually being the morning and evening sacrifices have been going on for. Uh, but now they they've they are not going on. Yeah, there's an interruption in the whole entire thing, really. Yeah, even the sacrifices. All right. Well, so what's the sanctuary referring to? The place yeah, of his sanctuary uh, was cast down. Yeah, that's the temple. In yeah. Jerusalem. Um, yeah. He yeah. was trying to, you know, he was trying to transform their culture. Um, you know, the word. Not very many people know this, but the word gymnasium. What, what? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The Greek, the Greeks. Uh, he he was trying to influence Jewish culture with the Greek culture, uh, including all the immoralities associated with that. Well, I mean, that Greek word comes from word for nakedness. So, <laughs> yeah, the, the Greeks ran around naked. You know, when yeah, which, which you know, I, I guess in some ways, some some of our sports people today kind of at least i remember you know basketball players back in the 1970s some of their shorts were practically like that <laughs> <laughs> they were so short you might as well say they were running around naked maybe that's where maybe maybe the, there's still some influence there of course i think the greeks probably the influence of the greeks was a lot more immoral than even than, than even that is but you know <laughs> Um, so here's what we actually learn um, in First Maccabees. Some people might not have access to this, so we're going to read a little bit um, just to show people how this is fulfilled. I mean, it's pretty interesting. So it says, yes. uh, Moreover, King Antiochus wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people. Everyone should leave his laws so that all the nations agreed according to the commandments of the king. Yea, and many also the Israelites consented to his religion. Sacrifice unto idols and profane the Sabbath. Well, that's pretty bad. For oh, the yeah. king had sent letters by messengers unto Jerusalem and unto the cities of Judea that they should follow the strange laws of the land and forbid the whole burnt offerings, which we were just talking about. Uh, the yep. offering starts to cease. Sacrifice, drink offerings in the temple, and that they should profane the Sabbath and festival days and pollute the sanctuary. That's why the sanctuary is cast down. And holy people set up altars and groves and chapels of idols and sacrifice to even swine's flesh, which was an unclean animal, unclean beast. Um, That they should also leave their children uncircumcised and make their souls abominable with all manner of uncleanness and profanation profanation, to the end that they might forget the law and change all the ordinances. And whoever would not do according to the commandment of the king, 
he said he should die. Wow. That's... Yeah, so you can kind of see why the Jews, especially the faithful Jews, obviously, you know, they did not like this guy. I'm surprised they haven't made a movie about this, <laughs> you know, uh, with all the historical oh, movies. Might, they might have, but it'd be interesting if they would make, you know, a, a, like a major motion picture that, you know, kind of like, you know, that appeals to everybody, that everybody would, would recognize. And I mean, you know, with the computer graphics and stuff, they could really do some, do something with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, so... Mel Gibson should probably do it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, I, you know, th through these, uh, you know, through these um, series that we're doing, I kind of also like to give some lessons. And, you know, we, we learned in Daniel 1, they tried, Daniel was trying, uh, was, you know, they were trying to convert him to the Babylonian religion. And he opposed you know, not going along by not, you know, he didn't want to uh, disobey the dietary laws and right. stuff of that nature. And so we have to also um, resist the transformation from the world. Uh, you know, the Bible says, love not the world nor the things are in the world. And we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, not be conformed to this world. And like I said, like I say here, it does not matter how hard it gets. We got to keep our commitment to God and him alone and Certainly, the Jews experienced some very dark times during the Antiochus the Epiphanes reign. And yeah, I, I recently heard a lesson talking about how Christians are to be countercultural when they need to be, and they need to embrace the culture when it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's a you know a fine line that a lot of people have difficulty. Uh, marking in the sand, so to speak. You know, when it comes to like food and, you know, you know, I can, I can embrace a culture, you know, like I love Chinese food, you know, there's nothing Me wrong too. with eating, you know, <laughs> nothing wrong I with ate eating, it yesterday, you know. actually. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So it's not always wrong to embrace other cultures or any culture, but when that culture uh, opposes God, just like Antiochus Epiphanes opposed God here, um, God calls upon us to be countercultural, and I like the verses you use there, Romans 12, 1 and 2, that's the first verse that popped into my brain, you know, we're to be transformed, not conformed to the world, but be transformed uh, to Christ and, and his law, and so um, we need to make that distinction between, you know, matters of truth and matters of opinion, and so often in the church, I think that line is muddled. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it goes on to say, um, we, we already read verse 11. Verse 12 says, Because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices, and he cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. So talk about verse 12 a little bit. Um, what is, what's going on verse there? Verse 12. Mm -hmm. um, he he opposed the daily sacrifices and he cast truth to the ground. I think that's a firm back to what you just read from uh, what was it, First and Second Maccabees, mm -hmm. all that. So, um, you know, casting truth to the ground. Basically, he he uh, um, instituted things that were against the truth of God's word. Mm -hmm. And uh, right. And during during this period of time, it says here he did all this and prospered. And this was. You know, this is a period of about, I don't know, six years, six or seven years or so when all this was going on, um, as we'll soon see here, I guess, later on. But um, <clears throat> during this period of time, it was a dark, dark, a dark period of time in Israel's history. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, when I think of casting truth down to the ground, um, well, uh, so it says this happened because of transgression. Let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, um, and, yeah, I'm sorry. And, and this actually fulfills what is said in First Maccabees 1, 11 through 15. It says, In those days when I, went there out of Israel wicked men who persuaded many, saying, Let's go and make a covenant with the Gentiles that are round about us, for since we have departed from them, we have had much sorrow. So this device pleased them well. Then certain of the people went, were so forward herein that they went to the king who gave them license to do after the ordinances of the nations. 
whereupon they built a place of, uh, I think that should be exercise. Uh, ex- I don't know why that got mixed up, but. Yeah, um, place uh, at Jerusalem. And, Jerusalem, basically. And they, according to the custom of the Gentiles, which they, they got naked um, and made themselves uncircumcised, forsook the Holy Covenant and joined themselves to the Gentiles and were sold to do mischief. So it's because yeah, of things yeah, like yeah. this, their own transgressions, that God brought you know, judgment upon them by using Antiochus Epiphanes to... That's um, that's exactly it. And that kind of is a foreshadowing of what God will do or what he did do in AD 70 because of their unbelief. God sent, you know, Vespasian and Titus. Uh, and, and ultimately, not only did, did they, you know, at least here, the Jews were able to recover from these, you know, sins, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. They would repent at least there were you know from this they realized that they were in the wrong and that you know the jews made a comeback uh, so to speak from this dark period in their history but later on in in the roman empire um they would not uh, at least the physical jewish nation would not the uh, faithful remnant god has always had a faithful remnant of jews among you know that stayed faithful and of course they eventually became spiritual israel in the church but this, I think, is foreshadowing what's going to eventually happen, uh, what we talked about last time in Daniel 7. Uh, you know, uh, now going to that part, casting truth down to the ground, uh, like we just read, well, earlier, I mean, they profaned the Sabbath day, Sabbath, they yeah. didn't, uh, you know, they didn't circumcise their children, uh, or they weren't able to sacrifice. It's not that they, they wanted to circumcise, but they were, you know, they were... Um, kept from doing it. Yeah, um, yeah. So you know, we have all these things that Antiochus is opposing. And, um, you know, that's happening today in our world. Unfortunately, we have many Antiochuses <laughs> uh, who are still... Well, you know, yeah, some lessons here for us, even in the church. Um, some people want to say that, you know, you can worship God any way you want. Well... You know, mm-hmm. one of the great, one of the grievous sins that the Jews were guilty of here was they cast truth to the ground when it came to their sacrifices. And I think, um, unfortunately, m- many there are lots of Christians who need to need to learn a lesson here from this prophecy that you know, worshiping God according to truth is it's still it's it uh, it still applies today. God still expects us to worship Him with the right sacrifices. And not just worship him, you know, mm-hmm. according to whatever the culture has in mind. Right, and 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 that's uh, in regards to what the content that's revealed in the new covenant, but also with our ad- attitude. Um, exactly. Exactly. Um, you know, uh, a Christian. You know, you know. Well, I'll say it this way: We know the Bible teaches that congregational singing is authorized, like Ephesians five nineteen. Colossians 3, uh, 16. Uh, but, you know, yes, that sometimes people sing half-heartedly or they don't sing at all, really, sometimes. And yes. that's just that's just as wrong because you're not doing that's, it with the right kind of attitude. And so and that, you're and that's treating right. it with a, yes. disrespect. You're casting truth down to the ground. So and th- and that's a good point. You know, sometimes I know like I know you're alluding to the verse in, in John chapter four, you know, worshiping God mm-hmm. in spirit and truth. Sometimes we say, you know, in spirit means with the right attitude and in truth means the right actions. But here I would argue that we're not worshiping God with the right attitude. Then you're casting truth to the ground as well. It's so to truly worship God, you have to have both the right, like you said, attitude and the right actions that God has, you know, that He wants. So, uh, very good points there. And, and yeah, uh, unfortunately, I think today not only is it the wrong actions that pe- many people worship God with the wrong actions, whether it's you know instrumental music or whatever, mm-hmm. but you're right. We, it, we could, you know, it's just as wrong to sing to God half-heartedly as it is to worship him with an instrument. And I think that's, you know, sometimes in, in the church, we we focus so much like on instrumental music that we forget that there's more to it than just that. Mm-hmm. One of the things I tell people yeah. is, um, 
and I'm not, I'm, not try, I'm not trying to get off of mechanical instruments of music, but <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing: why you know a lot of people will appeal to the old covenant. That's fine. Okay. Well, why why were they why were they doing it under the old covenant? It's because it was commanded. In Second Chronicles twenty nine. Yeah. Um, well, the thing about it is, not only was it commanded, there was a certain way in which they had to worship God with an instrument. They just couldn't just worship Him with an instrument any way they chose. You know that God prescribed exactly how that was to be set up in the temple. You know. Mm-hmm. Okay, now we're going to come Sorry. come back <laughs> full swing to verse thirteen and fourteen before we go off even further. <laughs> okay, so uh, you want to read for us? Sure. Daniel 8, 13. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? Verse 14. And he said to me, For 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Okay. So a lot of people want to know, of course, what does the 2,300 days mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and and uh, we can actually, I think we can actually, I believe, understand what he's talking about. Um, so remember, just real quickly, we know Antiochus, he desecrated the temple, he placed the idols in it, he, put sw- he made a swine to be offered on the altar, and so forth. So yeah. there was a group of Jews who wanted who desired to be faithful to God and they wanted to be desired to be true to the covenant. Um, so they revolted and it's called yes. the Maccabean revolt. And they actually tore down the altar and re- rebuilt it. Uh, or maybe he tore down the, I don't remember if they, t- I don't remember what the, he is referring to. Maybe it's Antiochus that tore down the altar and they rebuilt it. I, I'm not, I'm not positive. But I know they cleansed the temple and rede- rededicated it, which is what Hanukkah uh, dedication, yeah. um, and that's actually found in you know they're celebrating it in John ten twenty two. Um, so yeah, that's another question whether or not. Of course, it doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't matter now because the Old Testament is no longer uh, in force. And we know that, so we we don't celebrate Hanukkah as a religious holiday, just like we don't celebrate Christmas as a religious holiday anymore. But or, at, or as a religious holiday, but there is, you know, some wonder was Jesus actually celebrating Hanukkah or not? That's another, that's another rabbit that we don't really have to go down, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I'm just pointing out its reference in John ten. That's yeah. why we're just pointing out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is interesting. Uh, that it's, you know, the celebration of Hanukkah dates uh, basically with, with what happened here with Antiochus. So I'm just going to mention two views here, and, and then I'll let David talk about what what he believes it's referring to. So, is it a reference to uh, you know a thousand one thousand one hundred fifty days, which you know they offer these morning and evening sacrifices each day? So that's referring to the total number of sacrifices that were made, which would make it three and a half years, three month, three years and a few months. And so this would fit that time frame from when. Antiochus ceased the sacrifices, which was in December of 168, to when Judas Maccabeus rededicated it in 165 BC. So that's. But then there's the other view that okay, so we know that Antiochus IV actually started mistreating the Jews in 171, and um, it's this is stretching to the six years and four months to the time of the temple's rededication in 165. So, but, but let's see what you're, what are you, what are you trying to say about this passage? Yeah, I tend to accept the uh, latter one there. Uh, the 2300, like you were saying, the word day there is actually in the Hebrew, it's, it's evenings and mornings. Mm-hmm. Um, but just like in the creation account, you know, the days are described as evenings uh, and mornings. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so the question is, does the number 2300, does it refer, does the evenings and mornings, are they, does the number 2300 apply to the evenings and mornings separately, or does it apply to them together? And like you said, if you apply them together, then it would be 1150 days. And then if, if the 2300 is referring to the total number of evenings, as well as the total number of mornings, so 23, basically 2,300 days, then, 
Um, so that's that's a good question there. Um, I tend to accept the 2300 day uh, view, you know, six, about six years and about a third of a year, six and one third years, I think is what it ends up being. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's kind of my view. Cause I think the, if you go back up to the, into the prophecy itself early on, it's not just the uh, sacrifices season. It's, it's, it's referring to all of that, of, of that um, apostasy by the Jews. Mm-hmm. And and uh, the persecution of of you know Antiochus on the Jews and the influence of Antiochus upon the Jews. We know he murdered on- Onias the third, who was the last I think the law, the last lawful high priest, and put in a guy I think by the name of Menelaus I believe, mm-hmm. um, if I remember that correctly. Um, so basically from that time period until the rededication. Of, of the temple and everything, uh, the Levitical system was screwed up, basically. Mm-hmm. So I tend to take the view that it spans from the 171 BC to about 165. Okay. All right. Now we're going to get into the interpretation of it. So you want to um, you want to read it? Sure. Um, starting in verse 15, then it happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning that suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. Okay. You know, a lot of people will take this uh, to the time of the end. They'll, you know, sadly say, oh, well, that's the second coming of Jesus. Well, that's not what that's, <laughs> that's, not what that's talking about. Okay, that doesn't fit no, the context. No. You can actually prove that if you go to chapter 11. And, um, and when we get to chapter 11, we don't have it now. But when we get to chapter 11, I can, I can, if you carefully read it, you can actually see that there are two time of the ends. So clearly, if there are two of them, then it can't, you know, one of them can't be the second coming. There's only one second coming. So um, mm-hmm. time of the end refers to <laughs> this here. A period, a period, yeah, it refers to that there. You go ahead and read it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the end of the prophecy, the events that Daniel saw in the vision, which is the context, the end of Antiochus' exactly. reign, the rededication of the temple. So Exactly, exactly. Okay, so I'll read this. So it says, Now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground, but he touched me and stood me upright. And he said, Look, I am making known to you what shall happen in the latter time of the indignation. For at the appointed time, the end shall be. The ram which you saw, having the two horns, ding, ding. Yep. <laughs> they are the That's kings the of media of the at is. first. Yeah. <laughs> and the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. Well, <laughs> the large horn also that is between its eyes is the first king, uh, which would be and uh, Alexander the Great. Yep. As for the broken horn and the four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall rise out of that nation, but not with but not with its power. So. Yeah. The kingdom of Alexander the Great was weakened by that division. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we've already said, uh, we already said these things, so it can just go further. All right, Daniel 8, 23. In the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, talking about the Jews, which we just talked about, how they sinned yep. against God, a king shall arise, which is... <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> Antiochus. Yeah, having fierce features who understand sinister schemes. Uh, he just plays a really good politician, doesn't he? <laughs> yep, yep. He Crooked is. Politician. That's basically it. That's, how he, that's basically, if you study the history of Antiochus, that's kind of how he came to power. He, he played He played it quite quite well. You know, it's... Yeah. When he you watch... Ex- uh, he was actually a prisoner. Today. He was a prisoner in Rome. He was a hostage in Rome. yeah. So, which is pretty cool when you think about it. <laughs> which is why, which is why I want somebody to make a movie about this because <laughs> I think yeah. it's kind of interesting <laughs> how yeah. he got to be where he is. So, yeah, it's you know, you when you when you look at current state of politics today, 
and I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of a handful of politicians and how they <laughs> got where they were and, you know, how many, you know, I don't want to be crude, but how many butts they had to kiss or whatever, uh, you know, that kind of thing. I hate mm-hmm. to be that way, but you know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> I know. I know. Uh, you know, that's kind of the way in Tychus it was. He, he manipulated things to get where he was at. And that's kind of the way politicians do and is, is, you know, they say and do the, the right things to get where they need to be in life. And, you know, sadly, you know, a lot of members of the church um, do that. And you know what? It's not necessarily wrong as long as you don't do anything immoral. You know, I, I'm thinking of the Apostle Paul and how he used his Roman citizenship to his advantage. You know, Paul mm-hmm. played, you know, Paul played politics when it benefited him as well, but he didn't do it in an immoral way. He was just smart, you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. But Antiochus was not only was he smart, but he was he immoral. He was cunning, so he deceptive. Was cun- <laughs> yes, yes. So, like we said, um, you know, this this horn, the Seleucids, from three twenty three to sixty three BC, and like it says, it, it was in the latter time of their kingdom. So, Antiochus came about one seventy five. So that's almost you know two hundred years after the. Seleucid Empire start, started. And then it's, yes. you know, it says when the transgressors have reached their fullness, well, we, like we said, it's referring to the Jews' wickedness and God punished them. And Antiochus, he was a crafty individual. Um, and God, God gave him this power. Um, yes. Because he has a, God is sovereign to which he can give it to him so he will. So Exactly. Exactly. So right. unbeknownst, unbeknownst to Antiochus, God used him to judge his people, just like mm-hmm. he used, uh, you know, um, the Med- just like he used Cyrus in the Medo-Persian Empire to judge Babylon, you know, in Isaiah 13 and, and that kind of thing. God uses evil nations to even judge evil nations, and uh, and he uses these evil nations to judge even his people. Mm-hmm. Okay, so... I want to read verses 24 through 27. Sure. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. Through his cunning, he shall cause the seat to prosper under his rule, and he shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes but he shall be broken without human means. And the vision of the evenings and mornings, which was told, is true. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. Afterward, I, ro- I arose and went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, to me, okay... Okay, well, let's just say this was written in the second century BC. That would not make any sense to have that, but no one understood it. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, um, if if it's written after the fact, I mean, the guys, the guy does understand <laughs> what's going. on. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, um, it does. It does seem kind of odd, um, and. Yeah, that seems kind of an odd verse if it was written after the fact. Mm-hmm. All right, so um, we know that Antiochus, he does try to destroy the Jews. Um, just going through this, you know, it's pretty. I think it's pretty straightforward because we've kind of already talked about all of this. Um, so I, I don't really see any need to really, um, you know, uh, elaborate even more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so he tried to destroy the Jews, he tried to destroy the, their religion. He wanted to exalt himself as a god or, um, you know, yep. there, there is a possibility there. It could refer to the high priest. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. Which is an, a, just an extension of Antiochus, you know, that's kind mm-hmm. of he was kind of the, the pawn of Antiochus. But he, he, it is said in history, he did become ill and he died because he believed. And what's interesting is it says in Maccabees, like. He believed God was punishing him for his evil behavior toward the Jews. So, yeah, he died of natural causes, 
Um, I, I think there's like three or four secular sources that basically say that um, they might be slightly different in how they describe it, but it, basically, yeah, he died of natural causes. He wasn't killed in battle or anything. So you could say that God killed him in, in that sense. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not by human, not by human medium, but by just the, you know, just nature itself, whatever it was, God, God was the ultimate cause cause of it so people are welcome to read this chapter six just you know stop the video and you can read this for yourself uh it's very very interesting uh, I, I guess i do want to read this part though um because okay. I, think, I think this is kind of important uh because he says uh let me get a little bit bigger here for people it says uh let me just go back okay so it's, he's been uh so Let's see. Well, I think it, I think what was, well, I'm trying to remember what's going on here. Oh, well, well I'll just read that. <laughs> so it says, when the king heard these words, he was astonished and sore mood, whereupon he laid down, he, he laid down upon his bed and fell sick for grief because it had not befallen him as he looked for. And there he continued many days for his grief it was ever more and more. And he made account that he should die. Wherefore he called for all of his friends and said unto them, The sleep is gone from my eyes, my heart faileth for very care, and I thought of myself into what tribulation am I come, how great a flood of misery is it, wherein I, now I have I am come. For I was bountiful and beloved in my power, but now I remember the evils that I did at Jerusalem. And then I took all the vessels of gold and silver that were therein and sent to destroy the inhabitants of Judea without a cause. I receive therefore that for this cause these troubles are come upon me, and behold, I perish through great grief in a strange land. So that's interesting. That was uh, in Mac Maccabees, right? Mm-hmm. Chapter yeah. six, one through seventeen. Uh, so going back just a little bit, so it says um, there it got uh, so he's. Daniel was told, therefore, seal up the vision for it refers to many days in the future. Um, so, yeah, at the time, yeah, at the time that Daniel received that vision, it was well before, you know, 175, one, you know, 170. This was, you know, when Daniel received the vision, it was what, 550, I think. Mm hmm. So, so, and that's, yeah. So, what does it mean to seal up something to preserve it? show that yeah. its fulfillment would come to pass. Yeah, that's kind of my view of it. And I was going to say that same kind of language is used by John in, in Revelation. And it's he uses the opposite language. So it, to me, that this is one of the best arguments to show that the prophecy of Revelation, at least the prophecy as a whole, was not many days into the future, but was about to take place to those to whom John was writing. And mm -hmm. because... John borrows this imagery from Daniel, and Dan the point of the imagery is to show that the prophecy that Daniel gave, or that the, the prophecy that Daniel received in 550 was, it says there, you know, many years into the future or whatever, and so it was sealed. But the, the prophecy that John received in the book of Revelation uh, was not. It was about to occur, and to me, that's one of the best arguments to show that futurism as a as a way of looking at the book of revelation futurism is a false view mm -hmm. um er, at the very least the majority of the prophecies in revelation were about to occur otherwise that language used by john doesn't really make sense so the time is at hand <laughs> yeah yeah and of course you know some people try to say well time is at hand could be many years in the future and i understand all that but the fact that john is using the same kind of imagery that Daniel uses to, to show that the prophecy is not at hand, but into the future. To me, he wouldn't use this imagery if he didn't mean that the prophecies in Revelation, at the very least, uh, you know, were at hand. The prophecies as a whole were about to occur. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, that's kind of chasing rabbits, but I, you know, I think this is one of the best places to show that the book of Revelation had a near application to those to whom John was writing, and, and futurism is, is a false view of Revelation. Mm -hmm. 
Well, that ends our show for today. Uh, we really appreciate being with everybody. We actually completed it for an hour and 30 minutes. So, so, yeah. So stay tuned, everybody. Uh, we're we're going we're gonna to probably going to get to Chapter 9, um, and we'll talk more about it. So. Oh, yeah. Chapter 9 and the 70 Weeks Prophecy. That's one of the most powerful prophecies about Christ uh, in mm. the entire Old Testament. Looking forward to it. All right, everybody. Will you everybody take care? Bye bye. See you later. <laughs>